Hello everybody and welcome back to the channel. Today I wanted to do a little bit of a top 5 list. Some of you may recall from about 9 months ago I did a video on the top 5 plastic box sets that we need to see. This is going to be very similar to that but it's going to be about the supplements for the Black Powder game. Now if you don't play Black Powder I'm sure there are sets of rules that you do play that don't quite cover a theatre or a nation as well as you might want to. I'm thinking perhaps Bluka, I don't really follow that so much, but is there a theatre that Bluka doesn't cover yet? I'm sure there will be. So even if you don't play Black Powder, let me know in the comments down below what you would like to see from your chosen rule set. Now before we get into it, I want to have a quick discussion about the supplements and just recommend them to people. One of the reasons why I wanted to put this video out today was that there's still time to order them and get them in time for Christmas as a present. If that's, you know, if, if you're holding back on them because you're not really sure that you want them, that's perfect as a Christmas present. This video was originally going to be on ideas for Christmas presents, but it's kind of morphed into this one. I felt it was a little too soon to be talking about Christmas presents. Although, when I was working in retail, my old boss used to say, Mum's sh Christmas shop in November. So there you go. But yeah, are supplements worth the money? Well, I would say absolutely unequivocally, yes, they are. Now, they are perhaps not all created equal. I think as they've gone on, they have got better. Now, there are three supplements for the Black Powder Napoleonic era, and they are Albion Triumphant Volume 1. That covers the peninsula. So that's 1808-ish, 1808 to 1814 it's a little bit a little bit up in the air the uh, the start date for that one because it does include the imperial guard but it's very focused around britain as the name of the book would suggest so yeah it's a bit weird then we've got albion triumphant volume 2 that covers the 100 days campaign now if you play epic black powder most of the supplement is in the main rule book for that one so that's quite handy and thirdly they brought out a clash of eagles some years ago now while Albion Triumphant Volume 2 covers the three main armies from the Waterloo campaign, so the the Allied Army, so the British and the Dutch Belgians, it also contains the Army of the North, the French Army of the Hundred Days, of course, and the Prussians in their final Napoleonic form as well. As I should have mentioned that earlier on, Clash of Eagles basically has everyone who's not in the first two books. It's got Austrians, it's got uh, sort of mid to late Prussians, it's got Italians in there, it's got Warsaw, it's got Russia, obviously, it's got Bavaria, Württemberg, Westphalia, the Confederation of the Rhine, everyone, Naples, everyone who's not in the Albion Triumphant books are in A Clash of Eagles. I can't think of anyone except the Scandinavian countries that aren't in that supplement. So what is so good about them? Well, the supplements introduce the special rules and points values and army lists for the different armies. Now, I've seen a few people asking me, say, where are the points values? And that's because they are in the epic rule book, as I previously mentioned, but they're not in the main rule book, they are in the supplements. Points values, not they're, they're a bit of a contentious topic when it comes to historicals. Some people like them, some people don't. I quite like them, and a lot of people coming from other games, particularly I'm thinking Fantasy or 40k, that's what you're used to. And that's what's really good. Oh, even something like Team Yankee, I suppose. And that's what you like, because that's what you're used to. Now, one of the things I really like about points values is many, 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 many a day since I was at school have I whiled away the times making army lists for stuff. And that's what I absolutely love about points values. If you're just going to say, oh, yeah, I'm going to use the Orbat from the Battle of Aspen Essling for uh, Freon's division, well, you can't think about that for much longer, can you? Because that's it. It's all set in stone. So having those army lists is something that I really like, particularly when you're using points. Now, going forward into 2024, there may be a reason that you want to have a look at the points values and the army lists because... Well, I don't want to say too much yet because I need to confirm the venue, but something may be happening. Don't, uh, don't hold me to it just yet. Hopefully we'll hear more in December. In addition to all the wargamey stuff, there is also an excellent potted history of the three campaigns that the supplements deal with. Some really nice scenarios that are quite quite nice to collect towards as well, particularly in the 1812 book. They've got some actually pretty big scenarios. So 
you can start off with the small ones, make your way up to the big ones. And it's got some interesting quotes and pen pieces on various personalities and things like that. So it, the books are absolutely superb. I think the first one is very thin. It's about the same thickness as the two Victorian supplements they've done for the Sudan and South Africa. So it's a little bit thin, but the content is good. The 100 Days Campaign one is much better, I think. I think it's leaps and bounds above the Volume 1. But that's got more scenarios in there. Obviously, it covers more armies as well, so that's probably why. If you, the French are effectively two armies, because you've got the line and then the guard are almost an army on their own. And then you've got the Prussians and the British. And the Clash of Eagles, for me, is the absolute pinnacle of black powder supplements for any of the, the sub-periods they do. It's, it's fantastic. It's a great book. I cannot recommend it highly. Unless you're collecting British, I would go for Clash of Eagles, just because it, everyone's in there, even the Prussians and the Austrians are in there. If you're wanting an army list for your French, then Clash of Eagles would be my first go-to. Probably then I'll be in Triumphant Volume 2, and then I'll be in Triumphant Volume 1. One of the things that Volume 1 doesn't do, and it's a little bit disappointing, is go into all the different nationalities and the rando Mongol regiments that fought for the French army. Everyone's just French in that book. There's no real difference for the Swiss or the Irish or anything like that. They, they, they do very briefly mention it, but I think they, they could have done with a bit more of their time in the sun. So those are the three supplements that we have so far. They are superb. I cannot recommend them highly enough. Go out there and get them. I recently bought A Clash of Eagles again, I bought the digital edition, so I've now got it on my Kindle, which has been super helpful. So I love the book so much, I've got it twice. So in the same vein as my top five plastic kits, I'm going to do the top five supplements that should be the next one. Now, they won't be the next one. Leipzig has already been confirmed. I think it will probably be quarter two next year. So you're looking April through uh, July. At the very earliest, it could be even later, it could be next autumn. But uh, unfortunately, a bit disappointing, uh, Paul Sawyer did say at the Warlord Open Day that it hadn't even gone to the... the well, it, it was just being edited at that stage. So that's why I thought at least nine months lead time on that. So a bit of a shame there, but we know that Leipzig, the Battle of the Nations, is the next one. I've passed comment on before whether I think that's a good idea or not, so I'm just going to leave it there. But I won't be including that one. So this is the top five, and I'm going to do them in reverse order that I think we should see after the Leipzig one. And in number five, I think we should see the War of 1812 and the fight for sort of Canada slash North America slash and down in the Gulf of Mexico as well. So the idea here is that we've already got the British, the British from 1812. You can use the Peninsula War ones. For later, you could even use the Waterloo ones. Now, what you can absolutely use the Waterloo ones for, particularly the ones with covered shakos, are you can paint them blue and you can use them as Americans. The officers wear slightly different uniforms, but you could always sculpt a pack of officers. Now, this is one of the things I should say with these supplements is I'm looking at them from a commercial perspective for Warlord Games. At the end of the day, they're business. They've got to make money. So there's no point in me saying, oh, yeah, I really want them to do the three-day war between Bolivia and Australia or something like that, is there? Because no, one, no one's interested in that. So these are ones that I think could be commercially viable, ones that they either have miniatures for or miniatures that you could use for. In the next example, that may not be strictly true, but I am looking uh, at... They, they do do miniatures for eras that they don't do books for, I'm thinking specifically of the Crimean War here. They do mon miniatures for that, but they are not covered in any of the Black Powder supplements. And they also do a Black Powder supplement for periods that they themselves don't produce miniatures for. If you look at the Death on the Nile supplement, which is the Sudan one, then Warlord Games, you click on the part of the website that's got that on. It's got three products. It's got the Death on the Nile supplement, and then it's got two boxes of Perry miniatures. So they do do supplements for periods they don't produce models for. So America, they don't do that many models for it. But you can make the British and the Americans out of the British already. And they do do a range of... <laughs> they do do. And they have a range of Indians, woodland Indians, to represent Tecumseh's troops 
and that is in their French Indian War range. They might want to look at doing maybe American Dragoons or perhaps Militia, that would be quite good. But other than that, you, they've got the regular forces that you need, including the Indians as well. So I think 1812 would be a good seller, particularly in America. It's not a conflict that's that well known about in Britain, but I'm sure American history buffs know all about it. So I think it'd be very popular over there. They already do a large portion of the models needed. So I think that's a complete no-brainer. I think that could be done. Luckily, if you search online, someone has done a supplement for it already. I think it's called Niagara something. Uh, very good. Check it out. Just check out Black Powder Supplement War of 1812 and it should come up. Now, one other thing that I should point out here as well is that there's a really good opportunity for a crossover. I mentioned earlier on how the supplements have scenarios. Well, they... Uh, they're all land-based scenarios at the moment. Now, the War of 1812 had quite a large naval proportion to it. I mean, the whole the whole bat the reason the war was fought was because of stuff that was going on with the navies. So you could definitely have a, a scenario in there for the Shannon versus the Chesapeake or something like that. The battle on was it Lake Erie? I think it was, wasn't it? Um, so you know these naval engagements as well. You can bring in both Black Seas and black powder together in the same supplement i think that would be really cool there's a lot of people who aren't really that interested in napoleonic naval but they're interested in napoleonic land i'm not really sure why because the ships are awesome everyone like, surely everyone loves napoleonic ships i don't know i certainly do so i'd like to see a combined book that has a bit of black seas content in there not not too much you know five ten percent the vast majority of it's for black powder and i think the american theater the war of 1812 would be absolutely perfect for that. The only reason it's down here in fifth place is I, I toyed with this in the next one. The reason why this one's in fifth is because being a British company, I think it's a little less well known in the country here, which is where Warlord, I would imagine, make the majority of their sales. So number four is going to be, well, if you've ever listened to my top fives before, you will know that I all... <laughs> I always sneak in an honourable mention. There's never only five in there. So this one is going to be joint number four. It could be the same book, but I think it would be better as two separate books. In the same way as Death on the Nile and Zulu could really have been the same book. You know, you just have a bit for the Mardists and a bit for the Zulus in there. The British are pretty much the same. You could do this as well, and this is the War in the East. Now, by the War in the East, I mean... Napoleon's invasion of Egypt and Wellington in India. Now, Wellington in India in particular could very well be its own entire supplement. You've got the British Army, you've got the Army of the East India Company, you've got various mercenary bands roaming around, you've got the armies that were against them, the Army of Mysore led by the Tipu Sultan and things like that. So there's a load of different variation for the Brits there. And then you've also got Napoleon in Egypt, you've got the French, the very early French under the Directory, and you've got the Ottomans. So I don't know if you'd get a full supplement out of each of those theatres, I suspect you probably could. But if you were commercially minded and you thought, well, that's a bit too much of a risk, you could always combine the two of them into one book. Army-wise, they Warlord don't do much for the British or the French that early in the period. The British would be wearing like top hats. The Perrys do a fantastic range of those. You can also get parts to convert them from uh, Brigade Games. They used to be Victrix add-on packs, but they've obviously been bought by Brigade Games. So they're like the top hats. They're or round hats. They're called. So that would be the British. The Indians, they don't do any models for those. They'd have to sculpt a range of Indian troops. Uh, similarly with the Ottomans, they don't do a range of Ottomans, but they do do a couple of boxes. I've said it again. They do do a couple of boxes of Janissaries, so you could certainly press those into service of the Sultan as he's trying to fight against the French. Again, you could tie it in with Black Seas. You could have the Battle of the Nile in particular. If you were super desperate for the Indian front, uh, front you could have the Battle of Macau which actually wasn't a battle in the end. They just ran away, and Macau's near Hong Kong. So it's quite far away from India, but you know it's close enough for government work, I suppose. Um, so you could have those in there as well. Scenarios could be things like the Battle of Alexandria, the Battle of the Pyramids would be a really cool one. In the Indian side of it, you could, of course, have the Battle of Asai. You could have the Siege of Siring Patam. 
Now, bear that in mind because then that may come up later. But for my number four supplement, it would be the... I, I, I don't know what you'd call it. Europe Goes East. There you go. That's a terrible title for it. But that's the one I'll do for now. And that would be a either a joint book or two slimmer volumes. Obviously cheaper because they're not quite as thick. Of Wellington in India and Napoleon's Invasion of Egypt. Now, so far in these supplements, we have dabbled around the periphery. We've gone from the frozen Canadian north to the burning sands of Egypt. Let's get back into it, although it's not going to get much warmer, I'm afraid. I'm going to go to Central Europe, and for my third supplement, I'm going to look at the life and career of General Bonaparte. So not the Emperor Bonaparte, but General Bonaparte. Now, for me, this would be a supplement that covers the Revolutionary Army, similar to Napoleon in Egypt, but more European, as the uh, you could say. And by this, it would cover things like, well, we'd start off with the Battle of Toulon, would be the obvious one to start with. Another siege, stay with me on that one. And we would end that one in 1800 with the Battle of Marengo. This would be really good at introducing rules for early Austrians and early Prussians. Now, the Perrys have brought out an extensive range of Prussians, but we've not seen any rules for them in 1806. Now, don't get me wrong. There's no reason for Warlord to produce rules for miniatures someone else makes, but there's also no reason not to either. You could cover the Prussians in a battle for Valmy situation. Uh, you've also got the rules for the Levy on Mass there as well. But as I say, the main thing there would be early Austrians fighting in Europe, also fighting in northern Italy as well. You've got those funky little units like the Royal Guard of Venice and things like that that can join in the fun as well. I have actually considered doing an imagination army of Venice, Napoleonic army of Venice. I think that could be pretty cool. But uh, would they all have carnival masks on? They probably all have carnival masks on because why wouldn't they? But joking aside, so this would give you a look at the early Napoleonic War. And I think that's something that's very, very lacking in where Black Powder is at the moment. The very earliest we can go, as I said earlier on, is 1808. That's really towards the tail end. There's a lot of battling, a lot of fighting going on before. Actually, that's not towards the tail end at all. There's still loads more fighting and uh, carnage to come. But there was a lot before then as well, which is just not being served at all. So my third favourite supplement, uh, for want of a better term, would be the, the career of General Bonaparte from Toulon to... Marengo. Now, interestingly, you could also have a bit of a campaign system in here as well, as you gain, for argument's sake, influence points, or they could be honours, or something like that they could be called. And, you know, you can you top Napoleon? Can you beat his rise, basically? A career path where your general fights through these different battles, and can he achieve the same greatness as Napoleon? That could be pretty cool, actually. Not much scope for tying it in with Black Seas here, but, you know, that's fine. It, they don't all have to. Uh, that was just an idea to maximise the potential audience for these supplements. So, my second one, number two. Now, this is going to be a little bit of a an oddball one. I'm going to throw this one out there. See what you guys think. This one isn't confined to a particular theatre or campaign, but it is a supplement based around sieges. Now, we don't necessarily think of the Napoleonic War being all about sieges. We think, yeah, medieval times, yeah, you've got your castles and your trebuchets set up, and it's all gravy, and then their walls collapse, and then the janissaries storm through, and that's the end of Constantinople, or yeah, something like that. Well, that's not always the case. It don't, didn't only happen in medieval times. It happened a lot in the Napoleonic period. I've already mentioned Siring Patam, but you've also got things like Theodad Rodrigo and Badajoz. You've got Alvarez was another siege that happened in Spain. You've got the main sieges that were in Europe as well. When Messina was captured, oh, well, he wasn't captured, he was surrounded in uh, Rivoli. Going back over to America, you've got the Siege of New Orleans, of course. There were two sieges of Danzig. So there's a gazillion sieges in the Napoleonic Wars, and they're not really covered satisfactorily by the rules at the moment, I don't think. Now, it wouldn't necessarily just have to be Napoleonic either. I think it's sort of any black powder, if you if, excuse the term, uh, era siege could work as well. So you could even take it as far back as the War of Spanish Succession, probably. But if you had a supplement that was just around sieges, 
Again, there could be a small campaign system in there, which could be, you know, as the entrenchments go on and as the supplies run out, various factors can happen. There could be plague in the siege camp, or there could be rotten stores in the besieged city or whatever. So I, I think that could be pretty cool as well. A good little campaign system could be built up around that. We have seen entire supplements dedicated to sieges before, when Warhammer Ancients brought out, I think it was called Siege and Conquest, I think it was. The cover is of a Hundred Years War knight, like going through a, a city wall or a breach in the city wall. So I think that could be really cool. It's a bit out of left field. I'm not sure what your guys' thoughts on a supplement just for sieges would be. What I would say is that the current rate of supplements being released, uh, once every 15 years or something... I probably wouldn't waste that time on a siege supplement. If we were getting them frequently, maybe every three, four, six months, then I'd say that I think that's a bit more of an of an optimum one. So I've put it second on here because I think it could be a, a decent seller. I think it could be an interesting one. And I think it's a bit left field. Let me know what you think. Now I'm going to run through a few honourable mentions. There are a lot of different supplements I would like to see. My favourite campaign, as some of you will know, is the Thunder on the Danube, the Austrian campaign of 1809. I would absolutely love to see that, particularly if it contained rules for the Tyrolese Revolt as well, which had a way of, again, you could maybe look at a campaign, recruiting your own band of crazy outlaws and going up against the man. That could be pretty good, you know, pretty cool. You know, you could be the new Andreas Hofner, or could you not be? It depends. So, yeah, I think that would be quite funky. So that's one of my honourable mentions, is the 1809 campaign with rules for the Tyrol Uprising, or maybe even just a Tyrol Uprising on its own. In fact, just a, a now think about it, no, no, I'm going to have this as a separate one. So an honourable mention is 1809. Another honourable mention is Revolt and Revolution. There you go. There's, there's, you can even have that as your title, Warlord Games. And that would cover everything from the French Revolution up to the Vendée Revolt, the Tyrolean Revolt we've already spoken about, the revolt against General Bardin when he became the governor of Cairo. All sorts of revolts happened throughout the Napoleonic period, and they could have a whole supplement themselves. We spoke earlier on about introducing war bands into Napoleonic warfare. Well, that would be a perfect opportunity to do it. And, more and crucially, would be a really interesting modelling opportunity as well. You could get some really cool-looking armies out, out of it. Another one would be the Northern War of Russia versus Sweden. You could even bung in Britain versus Denmark in that one as well, if you wanted to look at Scandinavia. Uh, Battlefront have recently just done a Scandinavia book for Team Yankee. They've lumped them all in together. It's one of the most ridiculous books I think I've ever seen. Why on earth Sweden and <laughs> Finland would be fighting in the Third War? I have no idea. I mean, it's just... Whatever. But um, you could very much do them in the Napoleonic War against uh, Russia, against Sweden, and or Britain against Denmark. Again, if you wanted to do, well, actually either of those, then you could introduce some naval scenarios as well. And you could link those in with the, uh, the, the land battles for Black Powder. So with those honourable mentions out of the way, I think it's going to be pretty obvious which one I think the most uh, important supplement for Black Powder to bring out would be. We've not got it yet. And it is, of course, the Battle of Austerlitz or the Austerlitz campaign. This would include Ulm. And most importantly of all, you could also run it right through to 1809. It could include, well, 1808 and the Treaty of Tilsit. It could include the Prussians, Jena and Auschstadt. You could also extend it on for the Russians to include Eilau and Friedland as well. So I think this is why I think this is the number one most important supplement that we need for Black Powder. It covers basically the entire mid-war period. I, I split the Napoleonic Wars into different periods. For me, the mid-war starts when Napoleon places the crown on his head and it ends at the end of the uh, 1809 Danube campaign. For me, that's the mid-Napoleonic War. And this supplement could cover that entire section. 
five years-ish of some of Napoleon's greatest victories, some of his greatest battles, and some absolute humdinger fights that aren't really that well known, particularly in the English-speaking world, because we weren't involved in them. So you've got, obviously, Auschwitz. Everyone knows about Auschwitz. People know about Jena and Auschwitz. But you've got battles such as ones like uh, Heilsbergs, probably one of the better-known ones of the less well-known ones, or the Battle of Golemin, or, I mean, even Elau, although Epic History have just done an excellent video on those, or Prenzlau, the Saarfeld. There's loads of battles out there that you know aren't really that well-known, but they all go some way to explaining Napoleon's genius particularly his genius for having the right men in the right place. If your entire knowledge of the Napoleonic Warfare comes down to the Peninsula and Waterloo, you'd be like, well, who's this Napoleon guy? Why is he so important? So I think it's useful for educating people on the Napoleonic Wars. I don't mean that in a, uh, oh, you need educating, all you know is Waterloo. I, I don't mean like that at all. I mean that if people are interested in a, a period, if they get interested in a period because of, say, Waterloo, then it allows them to explore deeper aspects of the wars and you know, find something that may interest them more or just deepen their understanding of the period. Now, currently, Warlord don't do early mid-war French. They don't do the French in bicorns, effectively, which is what they would have worn at Austerlitz. But, you know, you can kind of get away with French in greatcoats with Shakos. They could always do a range of heads that you can supplement your current existing late French with. They've just done a range of heads to make Dutch Belgians in epic scale. So if, if they can make a pack of epic scale heads, they can definitely do it for 28 mil, that's for sure. They already do early war Russians, sort of. You can get away with using them as 1805. And they don't do any Austrians at all at the moment. So this could be the perfect excuse for them to bring out some Austrians. Or, as with the Sudan range, they could just leave that to the Perrys. And, you know, say, look, they've already got it covered. Let's not worry about that. Personally, I think that would be the best thing for them to do. And they could concentrate on expanding out the Russian army into areas that haven't been done yet, such as guard Cossack Lancers, for, you know, d d just a random example there. So that is my number one supplement choice. It is the Battle of Austerlitz. It should contain several scenarios, including perhaps two or three to deal with the Prats and Heights. It should have the stats in there for the the Grand Army. Oh well, well, yeah, yeah, well, yes, it is the Grand Army by that point. At the absolute peak of its powers, by the time you get to Waterloo, it's it's a bit of a tired, tired, sad old mutt waiting to be put out of its misery. I think, but at Auschwitz, it absolutely is not. It is the leader of the pack at that point. If you don't mind me mixing my metaphors. You've got the Austrians and the Russians, both very powerful nations, slightly let down by their officers. Well, they're very let down by their officers, slightly let down by their training, but mostly their piss poor officers. But they still had successes in the Fourth Coalition. It wasn't just a complete whitewash. By moving it forward to Jena and Auschwitz, you've got the Prussians in there. You've got the Saxons in there as well. And there's the possibility here of having some really interesting armies. Armies that are almost out of time. They've like marched through a time portal from the Seven Years' War and are now fighting in the Napoleonic War. So there's something really interesting there. Phenomenal cavalry, though. And then you start getting the coalition, if you'll, want me, if you'll excuse the term. But the coming together of the Russians, their equipment, their doctrine, their generals, they start learning on the job. They, they're getting better and better until they get to Friedland when they get absolutely mullered. But that's not the point. The point is they are getting better. So you know, when Napoleon invades in 1812, they're very much not the army in 1807. They've learned a lot of, a lot of lessons. So that is, I, I've, that is my number one supplement, Austerlitz. So just going back with them again, we've got five is the War of 1812. Four is Egypt slash India. Three was you know, the career of a young General Bonaparte. Two was uh, my left field one, the one on siege warfare. And number one, and I, I, I can't even, I can't believe this isn't the front and center of everyone who works for Warlord Games. But number one is Austerlitz. Let me know what you would like to see as the next supplement. We know that Leipzig's coming next. 
let me know in the comments down below now we are heading towards december it is the 19th of november when this video goes out so we are heading towards december and december means advent calendars and advent calendars mean the annual napoleonic wargaming annual uh, advent calendar challenge i'm gonna I, I need i need to think of a better name for it but what we will be doing is have a look out next sunday hopefully it's going to be next sunday i'm actually at a lord of the rings tournament for the whole weekend but i'm hoping to get it recorded before i go because i don't need to do much prep for this one Ho hopefully but um i will be hopefully posting next sunday all the details on how to take part in 2023's advent calendar challenge last year it was won by <laughs> last year it was won by a chap in romania and it was great great to see him. it was great to see these international entries it's been won by a chap in america beforehand and he got his parcel in i think august i think it was august july maybe but <laughs> hopefully i'll be able to get them out sooner than that this time but uh, well, it wasn't that i didn't get them out it was that they got lost in the postal system but uh he got he, they got there in the end that was the important thing i've i, I had it returned to me i've now got a, a free copy of waterloo but uh, i've already cracked it open so you won't be getting that one there may be a couple of extra little goodies in there as well if you don't want the waterloo starter set then you can get an epic starter one instead but that's all for next week let me know what your number one choice or your top three what would be your top three supplements that you would like to see the most and if it comes with a new range of troops, which ones of those would you like to see as well? Thank you very much, and I will see you guys next week. Goodbye.